Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations podcast. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Hi, I'm Stuart Reed. I'm the Deputy Managing Editor at Foreign Affairs Magazine, and we're here today to talk about the Israel package in our latest issue. We're joined by Alice Ben, Editor-in-Chief of Haaretz, Robert Deneen, Senior Fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Martin Kramer, President of Shalom College. Um, thank you all for joining me. Pleasure. Uh, yeah. let's, let's, uh, let's start with you. Um, in your essay, you write that the old Israel is over. Explain for us what the original Israel was and how, in your view, it has changed. Well, Israel originally was conceived by, by its founders, uh, David Ben-Gurion, Eshko, Goldemeyer, people like that, uh, who ruled Israel through the 1970s as a kind of uh, Western style, but at that time, very socialist, uh, democratic state, with uh, very secular ambition. So the Gurion uh, and Israel believed that religion was fading, was fading out. And they failed to, and they believed that if you build a strong enough state with strong enough institutions, and especially a strong military that was both necessary uh, given the threat and challenges that Israel was and still is facing uh, in the Middle East. But socially, to use the military as a melting pot for Jewish immigrants who came from all over the globe, uh, speaking dozens of languages, representing very different cultures, to put them through that kind of national service, and you come out with a secular, relatively liberal uh, democracy, and and, uh, and everybody was uh, speaking Israeli. The heroes of the period were uh, a farmer turned soldier, turned poet or politician or intellectual. And this is really changing. Uh, it changed once when Begin and the Likud and the right wing took over in the mid 70s. But Begin was very careful, although he revolutionized Israel in many ways economically. And foreign policy-wise, signing the peace treaty with Egypt, uh, and in and, and, and giving the religious and especially the ultra-Orthodox more involvement and more say on national politics, he was very careful not to shake the national institution. So for many years, people in the right wing were arguing that although the right has proven that it could win election after election, it doesn't really rule the country because the the other powers that be, media, academia, institutions, other, other institutions like the judiciary, the military command, the intelligence chiefs, were still led by people with political alienation, close to the left. And, and uh, when Netanyahu first took office 20 years ago, he set out to change. He was speaking then about changing the elite, changing the speech, uh, then changing the public discourse, not only because of uh, you know some kind of revenge of the of those who were formerly discriminated or pushed over or pushed aside, but also for a political goal. Because if you want to keep Israel's control over the West Bank, uh, one way to strengthen it is to weaken those forces within Israeli society who supported compromises, supported the two-state solution, and which in Netanyahu's, in Netanyahu's view still holds enormous uh, overstated power compared to their uh, to, to the views of the Israeli public in institutions like the media and the military. Last year, after winning the election, Netanyahu made, for, for the first time, Netanyahu made a strategic political choice to build a right-wing coalition rather than the center-right government, which he presided over in the previous six years. And one day, you know, before the election, we had this risk-averse, very conservative politician who was very careful not to rock the boat domestically. And almost overnight, we got the old right-wing radical of the 90s coming back to shake the elite, to change, to, 
to rebuild national institutions, to change the discourse. And in the past year, all of those old elites uh, uh, feel under siege and under attack by the government. Uh, and through through bills to limit the to limit the uh, uh, to limit the influence of, or kind of shaming of, of the left wing NGOs to limit public expression uh, of the Arab minority and uh, to change the way culture is subsidized and so on to change the curriculum of civic studies in, in, in literature in Israeli schools. And you know, it, each incident in itself, you know, some of these bills are yet to be to be uh, to be made into laws by the Knesset. But still, the net the net outcome of all this is a true effort to change the, the public face of Israel. Obviously, it faces opposition. Not all of it is going to happen, but it is a different Israel than the one that I grew up in, and and then the one I believe that even was before the last election. And, the, and and last but not least, several weeks ago, Netanyahu faced once again the same choice. He, he sought to extend his coalition from a very slim majority for that. And once again, he could pick between bringing in the Labour Party and moving to the center or bringing in Lieberman's far-right-wing party. And he picked Lieberman, and he made him defense minister, and he ousted from his cabinet uh, Bogi Alon, the former defense minister, was the last kind of Ben Gurionist in, in the Israeli government, in, in, uh, in the right wing. And today we have a very right wing coalition that Israel has never had before, with, maybe with one exception. But that exception was Shamir, who again did not try to channel the institution. And now we have a radical government that is seeking to change the way Israel behaves domestically and, and appears to the world. Um, Martin, you paint a much more optimistic portrait of Israel in this moment. Why, in your view, is the status quo perfectly sustainable? Well, I see no need to repeat uh, what I have in my article. It's very short, 2,500 words. Um, the status quo, the sustainable status quo, applies uh, mainly to the situation with the Palestinians. Um, as regards the Palestinians, uh, we've had now for 50 years an evolving situation. It has gone through several stages. Um, not all of them were sustainable, in fact, and um, we had intifadas, we had the Oslo Accords, we had the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. But it seems the situation we have today has created a dynamic in which neither the Palestinians nor the Israeli government, um, neither Netanyahu nor Mahmoud Abbas, has a sense of urgency that something must be done now because the situation is intolerable. And that's because the situation in the West Bank is also very complex. Just as Israel is a very diverse landscape, so is the West Bank. There is occupation and there is I say, unoccupation. I wouldn't call it independence, but there is an authority in, which, uh, uh, in, in whose territory Palestinians go about most of their daily business without any uh, degree of immediate uh, Israeli interference. And this seems to have been uh, reg come to be regarded... Uh, by both sides as a kind of workable modus vivendi until such time as something more can be done, until a more, a, um, uh, let's say, a more ambitious program can be put into action, which would require concessions that neither side is prepared to make at the present time. So it's working. And when one looks around the region as a whole, one sees that this is, this I would categorize as a relatively stable conflict. It is a conflict, but it's a relatively stable one as compared to other conflicts raging across uh, the Fertile Crescent in the rest of the Middle East. Um, and there is a willingness on the part of both sides to make an investment in the status quo. No status quo sustains itself. This one is being sustained actively by both sides. A good example, of course, is cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians in the security level, which is actually quite intensive at the present moment. Um, this is not a good time to shake things up for all sorts of reasons on the Palestinian side. They're undergoing uh, the first stages of a succession struggle, uh, and that's going to take some time to work itself out. And, of course, there's still a division between Hamas and, 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 uh, and uh, the authority, and uh, there has been no progress made on a reconciliation there. So I see all the elements in play for a continuation of the, of the, of the status quo. Domestically, um, Alouf has argued here that there's been a dramatic um, a shift 
uh, domestically in an attempt to replace the elites by a deliberate attempt by Prime Minister Netanyahu to replace one elite with another, or uh, a series of elites with another series of elites. Um, I don't see that either. Um, I think that um, in the case of the domestic situation, we have had changes. There's no question about it. Um, Israel has moved right, although to some extent the right has moved left. You have the Likud adopting an official position in favor of a two-state solution, something which only a few decades ago was only the position of the Communist Party. So there's been definitely a, a shift, but it's, if, if, it, but one can be a supporter of the Likud today, for example, and still be a supporter of a two-state solution. One can even be a supporter of Naftali Bennett, according to polls of his, uh, his voters, um, uh, some 40% to as many as half of them support a two-state solution, and the official position of the party is against it. So there's a lot going on beneath uh, the surface, which um, I think belies the notion of a, of, um, of a revolution, as it were, within, uh, within Israel. There's, the word elite also deserves, I think, some qualification. There are two different kinds of elites. There are serving professional elites, and then there are, I'd say, dominant um, self-interested elites. Um, the old serving professional elites uh, have moved increasingly into the, um, into the second category. The old elites haven't disappeared. They've become extraordinarily wealthy, actually. Uh, paradoxically and ironically is a consequence of many of the policies which are implemented by, um, by the crude governments, liberalization, privatization, and so forth. So um, there's been a retreat of the elite to, uh, to a, a, another, an, another bastion. Um, it's a loss of political clout. There's no question about it. I think an increase in economic clout, probably also um, ex- exacerbating some of the um, uh, some of the inequality in Israeli society. But I would I would I think it would go very far. It would be very far to go to say that the old elites are finished. They stopped being socialist a long time ago, um, uh, and um, they and one gets a glimpse of the new elite of the old elite and its persistence merely by flying into Tel Aviv and looking out the left side of the aircraft. The residential towers, the commercial towers, now this is the throbbing center of Israel's old elites now made rich. Uh, and I think that that's the point that seems to have gone missing in both in a loose discussion, and I didn't actually delve in it in any great depth. Rob, let's zoom out and talk about the regional picture. You write that the Israeli military is stronger than ever before. You know, the threat of invading armies has disappeared. Yet, when Israelis look at the threats confronting them, they now feel a sense of hopelessness. Why is that? Well, what I tried to outline, and first let me uh, preface my comments by saying, you know, I'm, I'm the only uh, person in the package of all the authors who, who is not Israeli. Uh, I'm a student of Israel, let's say, a frequent visitor. I've lived in Israel, worked there as a diplomat, and worked on Israel as a scholar. But I, I you know, I, I want to say up front, I'm a, a, a student and uh, I'm not Israeli, but uh, I watch Israel very closely. And what I see is, is you know, first and foremost, a, a bit of a dichotomy, let's say, between a popular sentiment, which is one of great um, personal vulnerability, uh, uh, as opposed to national vulnerability. So I distinguish between, you know, the traditional first, uh, let's say, three decades of Israel's existence in which it fought repeated conventional wars, in which it had to confront uh, numerous invading armies, in which it was outnumbered, uh, in which Israel was outnumbered, to the situ- situation today, where on the one hand, Israel is, is a regional power, a regional superpower, and yet, for all that power, that does not remove the sense of vulnerability that individual Israelis feel. Uh, so since last October, you've had this uh, development uh, that is called different things. You know, some people want to debate whether it's a third intifada or what it is, but clearly there is an upsurge of uh, violence that is not um, centrally organized that Israelis um, feel somewhat vulnerable to. Uh, and so what has changed is that... Uh, uh, Israel's adversaries today are largely uh, terrorist organizations and sub-state actors uh, that see the Israeli weak spot as not being the military, but the Israeli home front. And that's uh, precisely who it is now targeting. And so the whole nature of the threat that Israelis feel is different. The threat is not as a nation, uh, but as individuals. Uh, 
Um, and that was kind of what I was trying to, the, the, the transformation, I'd say, in, in threat perception um, that I identified. And what this means is that there's a gap that I experienced, let's say, between uh, Israelis at a popular level, uh, who on the one hand are quite, you know, in one sense comfortable, and yet there is an underlying sense of anxiety in their uh, daily lives, and then let's say the professional uh, national security establishment, for lack of a better word, which includes the military, the internal security forces, uh, 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 those people whose job it is to ensure that Israel uh, is secure. And, and for those people, uh, they see that Israel's position is quite strong uh, and that uh, Israel has a lot of cards to play. Uh, and, uh, you know, but at the same time, they are, um, and, and they're the ones, I think, who see a, a, a much more varied region. Because at a popular level, uh, there's this sense, especially since 2011, with the Arab uprisings, that, you know, the region is just a, a cauldron of chaos and instability and one huge undifferentiated mess. And we Israelis cannot relate. You know, how can we even consider uh, dealing with this? Uh, if we had made peace with Syria and given back the Golan Heights, what a mistake that would have been. If we gave back uh, the West Bank, uh, to the Palestinians, well, then we might have ISIS on our border uh, inside today. There is this sort of underlying sentiment at a popular level. Within the kind of elite level, let's say, within the security establishment, I think there's a much more um, uh, uh, differentiated analysis. Uh, if you listen to the chief of staff, uh, General Eisenkopf, he, you know, he will, they will talk, or the head of military intelligence, they will differentiate between threats and opportunities. Um, and, you know, they see that, that the, the region actually has some tremendous opportunities, that the peace that Israel has reached between uh, uh, Egypt uh, and itself is stronger today than ever. Yes, there's a disappointment that the people-to-people, -people, the normalization, the trade, all the kind of non-military, non-security elements of that relationship uh, have been in the freezer. Uh, but there's also a recognition that that peace since 1979 has been stable, secure, and fundament fundamentally altered Israel's strategic posture in the region, combined now with the relationship that Israel enjoys with Jordan and its security establishment. Again, not a warm people-to-people -people peace, but a strategic peace that has fundamentally altered Israel's position. And so then there's a question today, is, you know, is there, are there new opportunities uh, in the region um, uh, but maybe I should stop now, and we can talk about that. But I don't want to sort of resuscitate my uh, uh, regurgitate my whole article uh, in one bite here. Uh, let's, let's take us into the future a bit. Um, the changes that you've documented in your essay and, and discussed today, where do those lead? What do those mean for the future of Israel as a Jewish state? What do they mean for the future of Israel as a democratic state? And what do they mean for the two-state solution? Well, the two-state solution, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to correct uh, Martin. The Likud never adopted the two-state solution. It was Netanyahu's speech at Bailan University seven years ago, but it was never adopted. The Likud doesn't have an official platform since then. Because of that debate, we called the members of the Likud faction in the Knesset today and believe that the vast majority uh, would oppose the two-state solution, including the most senior ministers in the cabinet. But the mainstream position in Israel uh, for several years uh, started with the, with the collapse of uh, Camp David's peace talks 16 years ago, and even more so in recent years, is that the two-state solution is a great idea, but it's not practical. And in the last election, the word peace or two-state solution or negotiation disappeared from the campaign. Yes, it is buried deep down in the platforms of the center and left-wing party. But no party, even not the party representing the Arab community in Israel, the joint list, waves that flag, which means that for all practical purposes, it is off the table. And, and, the, and the, the new Netanyahu government is more or less preparing the public opinion and the rest of the world for a permanent occupation. Yes, there is, you know, the, the call to annex, to formally annex the West Bank or parts of it are marginal, uh, and even and even in uh, the uh, foreign affairs uh, issue, we ha you had an interview with the Minister of Justice, Ayelet Shaked, 
who says, yes, she supports the, the annexation of the parts of the West Bank, but it's not practical now. But in practice, it is happening. And the status quo, I, I agree here with Martin in saying that it's sustainable. It's been sustainable for 49 years. Nothing is seriously threatening it uh, in the foreseeable future. And therefore, opposing the occupation is a moral choice, not a strategic one and not a political one. Yes, it is sustainable. Is it good for Israel? Uh, will it make Israel uh, an apartheid state in the future if the permanent occupation and Israel rules over millions of people without civil rights? Will they at some point demand such civil rights and therefore threaten the existence of Israel as a predominantly Jewish state? These are the questions at hand. In, in, the, in the current situation, the two-state solution appears as a slogan with very little content. Martin, you say in one of the most, I think, interesting parts of your essay, you say that Israel doesn't need the United States anymore, essentially. So what would a post-American Israel look like? Well, uh, um, first of all, um, I think, Aluf, that is a correction. There is actually no Likud platform. Likud has been running in elections without a platform. So um, the, the, the commitment is a personal one by Netanyahu, one which hasn't been ratified by the Likud per se. And he's correct on that. Um, I don't say that Israel doesn't need the United States anymore. What I said was that the whole uh, concept behind the idea of Jewish sovereignty is that the day will come when the, when the Jews will find themselves alone again. Um, uh, it has to be a strategic assumption that at some point also um, the uh, relationship with the United States um, will wane. This may take a very long time, um, but we got a, an inkling of it or a taste of it during the course of the Obama administration, uh, in which case Israel has to be able and be prepared to, let us say, reenact some of the go-it-alone uh, spirit that it had in the first 20 years of its existence when it did not have the close relationship with the United States, which developed after 1967. Um, now, um, no one, of course, in Israel will publicly talk about that because, uh, certainly not in the defense establishment and the political establishment, precisely because right now we're in the midst of a negotiation for another memorandum of understanding. And in that course of that negotiation, Israel is presenting itself as the linchpin of regional security vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the United States. So um, this is not a subject that's openly discussed. And if you ask any Israeli, they'll say, well, bottom line, we have to do everything possible to keep our, to restore our relation, the relationship to the United States to what it was before Obama. Uh, but I do think that Israel is going to be increasingly thinking about um, sort of Plan B, uh, not necessarily because the United States has fallen out of love with Israel, but because the United States has despaired of the Middle East. It looks across the Middle East; it doesn't provide those mission accomplished moments that presidents crave, and in fact, it looks like an endless. Uh, a cauldron of conflicts which could suck the United States in. And uh, as the United States withdraws, we already see vacuums in, emerging in, um, in various places across the region, uh, with which Israel will have to contend, along with some other Middle Eastern states which historically relied on the United States. So there, has to, there, there is, I think, the beginning of, um, of a movement towards, uh, let's say, accelerating relations with other powers, outside powers, uh, Russia, China, India, and of course, trying to build uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, relationships on a strategic level with some of the Arab Sunni states. One wag has described Israel as the first Jewish Sunni state. Uh, and um, this will, of course, happen behind the scenes because it's unlikely that any of these states will come forward publicly to embrace Israel as long as there is no progress on the Palestinian front. But behind the scenes, a great deal is being done. And, I presume that more will be done in the future. So I would call it diversification at this stage. There is no substitute for the United States. No outside power can provide a substitute for the United States. But if the United States does step back from the region, and I think there's every indication that, um, that the distancing that characterized the Obama administration is going to become a more salient feature of U.S. policy in the region, uh, which will extend to both political parties, uh, because there's um, um, it's a general uh, American public um, a reluctance to be drawn again into the Middle East as it, as it had been drawn in after 9-11. I think in that, in, in that scenario, the diversification is going to uh, accelerate. It also means that Israel has to get the most that it can out of this current memorandum of understanding. There's an effort on the part of the Obama administration to actually make uh, 
the memorandum of understanding into um, into a very limiting one, not in terms of the, the wherewithal which will be transferred to Israel, but the terms under which it can be used. So this would actually constrain Israel's independence even more. The trick for Israel is to both to, to, to obtain what it needs from the United States and to retain the freedom of action uh, to use it. Rob, you served in the U.S. government, so speaking of U.S. policy, uh, let's, uh, let's look forward. Come next year, we're going to have a new president. What would a President Hillary Clinton or a President Donald Trump mean for the U.S.-Israeli relationship? Um, if I may, I'd like to speak to a few things that Martin said, because I, I, I um, uh, would like to respectfully disagree with a, a number of the points he made. Um, you know, I think uh, in the first instance, um, he spoke about uh, Israel and the United States uh, drifting apart, and then, and, and in essence, Israel needing to prepare for that day uh, that, you know, it is alone. And, and it was, you know, Martin wrote about it in his article, and this is very deeply rooted in the whole Zionist ethos that um, Israel and the Jewish people, you know, uh, people who dwell alone. And I think the danger here is to make a virtue out of a necessity or maybe make a necessity out of a virtue. Uh, but in any case, I think it's divorced from the, the realities of, 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 of what Israel is today, which is a medium-sized power in the region, which is, both, which is a very closely aligned with the United States, along with a number of states, and that Israel benefits a tremendous amount, as is well known, uh, you know, from its relationship with the United States, both directly and indirectly, directly in terms of all the uh, military hardware, the political cover it gets in international fora, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and also indirectly because many countries throughout the world perceive uh, the route to Washington as coming through Jerusalem. And so this is also a force multiplier in terms of Israel standing in the world. Um, and to me, that's a, a tremendous asset that would be a, a, a shame to forfeit. And you hear in, in circles, especially in the right in Israel, which is, you know, um, Look, we're doing okay. Uh, our relation, and Martin laid it out. You know, relationship with India, with China, with Russia. You know, we're opening up. So, what do we need Europe for? What do we need the United States for? And I think this is a very a misreading of of reality because at the end of the day, Israel's legitimacy and whole existence is rooted in the Western tradition, uh, which uh, came out of, uh, of, of 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 the Western history, uh, recent and ancient. Uh, and and to squander something that exists uh, is, is is shame, and so that's why I recommended in my article actually something even much more dramatic than another ten year MOU, which was a formal alliance. Uh, because if you look at the trends, um, you know, taking place in Israeli society, as Aluf mentioned, and the trends taking place in American society, as we see taking place, particularly in the Democratic Party, in generational changes in the United States. The old romantic attachment that the United States feels, or Americans feel towards Israel, is um, is shifting, and slowly and imperceptibly, as the occupation nears its 50th year of the West Bank, the perception in the United States has grown from one of seeing Israel as David against the great uh, uh, surrounding arm power, and Israel itself being the Goliath. However inaccurate that may be. That is a perception that is taking hold, and we're seeing it now playing out in the Democratic Party over the platform fight, for example. So to me, now is an opportune moment, if I were an Israeli, to want to lock in the benefits of the U.S.-Israel relationship in a formal alliance in the way that many countries in the world have done so. Uh, because it, the relationship, um, the United States, uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship, while it is rooted in a number of things, shared values, shared history, all sorts of things, has also become strategic. And Martin's right. The United States may be looking to pivot from the region, but what we're seeing is that that's aspirational, and reality keeps pulling us in. Um, we are now, we, we haven't left Afghanistan. We have not left Iraq. We are in Syria. We are in Libya. We, <laughs> it may be quicksand. And who can we rely on? Who do we turn to? Uh, who are our real allies in the region? The United uh, Israel, and foremost. Um, and so if I were Israeli, I would want to be capitalizing upon this. Um, so it seems to me, you know, just, you know, analytically, uh, to, to squander a, a winning hand um, would be a mistake. And especially if you look over the, uh, the time horizon, I don't think the, the, the demographic and societal changes taking place both in Israel and the United States 
augur well for a, an improvement in the relationship. So now would be the time I would want to lock in uh, as much as, as can be done. Now, you ask about, you know, what the next president will do. I mean, I, I think that um, a lot of the mistakes that have been made uh, uh, in, in the last eight years between the, in, in, the, in the handling of the U.S.-Israel relationship have been more um, style than substance. Uh, I experienced it at both ends when I was heading the quartet. In Jerusalem, I would uh, be in frequent meetings with the prime minister uh, after he would return from the United States. I also would see it from the American side. And I think a lot of the, 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 the dysfunction that exists in the U.S.-Israel bilateral relationship is actually personal uh, more than it is strategic. Uh, and um, a lot of it has to do with the style that, um, that, uh, that, that um, uh, originated from not building a, a personal relationship at the onset. And I think whoever becomes the next president, particularly if it's Hillary Clinton, will first and foremost want to reestablish a effective uh, working relationship uh, with the um, with the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, but uh, you know that will that's that's how it will start. Uh, there's nothing inevitable about that. There's nothing to say that just because you try that you'll be able to establish a better relationship. Um, and that's why I also urge in my article. You know, Israel to also move from what I've seen as a, a, a dramatic shift in the conduct of Israeli foreign policy. Martin actually mentioned it. You know, the first 20 years of Israel's um, existence, you had a very activist Israel, Israel that sought to uh, exploit the uh, international stage uh, and, and punch above its weight. Um, to a very to today, where you have an Israel which is largely reactive and passive in the hood, and so. You know, one thing that I observed when I worked in the White House, working closely with Prime Minister Sharon and his administration, you know, when he saw an international constellation of efforts that he did not like, um, he initiated a different uh, approach, and that ultimately was the Gaza disengagement. Now, you can debate the merits and the merits of the case, but the reality was he seized the initiative. He wanted Israel to be in the driver's seat. Today, we have a, a situation in which, um, yes, the Prime Minister of Israel um, cites a 2009 speech that he made once that, to, in order to try to keep the international community off its back, as Aloof mentioned. But the commitment to this two-state solution is one that I don't think the international community thinks is very sincere. Uh, and, uh, and so it seems to me that if I were, again, an Israeli and, or as a friend of Israel, um, I would be urging the, uh, the government to say, if you don't like the sorts of things you see either coming out of France or the Security Council, or the United States, then it behooves you uh, to take the initiative. And you, Israel, as a strong country in a, in a, in a, in a very volatile region, have a lot of uh, room to maneuver. And I think, you know, I would be, I think there's a lot of room for creativity here. One last point I would make. I'm spending a lot of time in the Gulf. And there's a danger today, I find, in Israel to, to, to want to believe that what is happening between Israel and the Gulf is just the kind of the you know the, the burgeoning secret alliance that um, that is uh, just waiting to happen, and that so much is happening behind uh, beneath the, the the surface. I don't think that's accurate. Uh, it is true there is a convergence of interests between Israel and many of the Arab states, the Gulf states, uh, but there's a profound disconnect between Israel and the Gulf. Uh, both sides don't really understand each other. Both sides don't speak each other's language. And there is a huge elephant in the room, uh, which is the Palestinian issue. And particularly, whatever the Arab commitment to the Palestinian issue or lack thereof, uh, the Arab elite now is all the more uh, unwilling to step outside its own uh, uh, consensus uh, on the street for fear of its own people. And the Palestinian issue has salience uh, on the, you know, for the Arab people. And that is going to be a permanent check on how far the tactical uh, maneuvering that Israel and the Gulf states can ever uh, realize. And it seems to me that there's a real opportunity for Israel to achieve something it has sought since its inception, which was um, uh, recognized international borders. And that is something that the Arabs are offering, but Israel doesn't seem too interested in, in really exploiting. My last question is for Aluf and Martin. Um, the United States is in the midst of a presidential election. How is that playing out in Israel, the competition between Trump and Hillary? So, Aluf, let's get your quick take, and then we'll move to Martin's. It doesn't really play. I mean, uh, most people think 
uh, people in the chattering classes are interested in it, but uh, they fail to see the difference between Clinton and Trump as related to Israel. You know, the last poll I saw favored Clinton, but I don't think uh, th th there's not there's not enough interest. I mean, there's interest in the show, there's interest in the fight, there's interest in the match, but uh, and Trump is always interesting uh, 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 and extra great, but. Uh, I failed to see a serious position in, you know, among pundits or politicians in Israel or commentators regarding how this will play. Clearly, either either candidate uh, would have would enjoy different relationships uh, with, with uh, the Israeli prime minister than Obama. And uh, but, but there, there's not much expectation of change beyond that, I think. Martin, what's, uh, um, which, what does it look like from your view? I, I completely agree with uh, Aluf on this. I don't, um, <clears throat> uh, I don't have a different uh, take on it uh, in any way whatsoever. I would, if, if you'll permit me, just make a few bullet points in response to Rob before we open to questions. Um, um, of course, I was not arguing that Israel should squander what it has. Far from it. I said that, in fact, um, this present negotiation is very important to Israel. Uh, maybe our difference is on the time frame. Uh, what Israel has learned and what the Zionists learned before that is a great power is, isn't ever abiding. Um, Britain issued a Balfour Declaration in 1917, and already by 1947, 30 years later, there had been a dramatic transformation in its position. Israel found itself arrayed against Arab neighbors who were supported by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union appeared in the Middle East and then disappeared uh, in the Middle East. So um, taking the long view of a historian, uh, uh, I think it would be naive of anyone to assume that the United States is in the region forever. In fact, it was Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, who himself declared already the end of the American era in the Middle East. So it would be prudent for Israel to prepare for that. Uh, Israel is true is just a medium-sized power, but it's in a particularly weak part of the world. Uh, this is not the heart of Europe or East Asia. Um, it, it does have much more potential to go it, to go it alone in many instances in a part of the world which, uh, in w which there isn't a great deal of ability to project power by states beyond their borders, or even to maintain their integrity up to their borders. It's interesting, it is true that, of course, many, many in, the, in, in, the, in the region viewed Israel as a backboard to Washington, go through Jerusalem to get to Washington. But it's interesting that even at the time when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was at odds with Barack Obama, um, uh, this seemed not to have diminished in any way the desire to connect with um, with Israel. If anything, it seemed to have raised among some circles the respect in which Israel is held, the fact that it had sufficient um, wherewithal within the American public to actually stand up to an administration. Um, I have to disagree with Rob about the idea that one can lock in an alliance in a situation in which support is constantly being eroded, if he's correct in his assessment. This is not a Treasury bill where you can sort of get yourself a preferable, a, a preferable um, a rate of return, and, and come what may, it'll be honored and respected. Uh, and we have an example of that in 1956, for just just for historical reference, uh, Ben Gurion uh, got an, um, uh, a, um, a guarantee from Eisenhower about keeping the Straits of Tehran open in return for an Israeli withdrawal from the Sinai. In 1967, Israel tried to make good on that, and Lyndon Johnson said, "I can't because we're in Vietnam now, and I don't think my Congress would support it." Um, so even a formal treaty might have its limits in these circumstances, and certainly even if it, it, such a thing existed, there'd be disadvantages both from the American and the Israeli point of view, and a need for Israel still to prepare itself for that day in which the treaty, for whatever reason, might not be fully operative in the case of a disagreement between the parties. So, um, um, so uh, just to wrap that up, I agree that, um, that all this may be well down the road, uh, hopefully it is well down the road, and hopefully I think, um, and I, I would I would hope that Rob is right, and that the United States will come back to the region and assume its responsibilities um, uh, in full. But um, but um, we only have one Jewish state, and it's taken 2,000 years to uh, to um, uh, to establish it, and I don't think we can take the gamble on whether a President Trump or um, or a uh, Hillary Clinton, or whatever happens in what has become, let's say, a less than predictable the United States will actually stand up and, and meet those responsibilities in the future.
Thank you. At this time, we will open the floor for your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press the star key followed by the one key on your touchtone phones now. Questions will be taken in the order in which they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the questioning queue, just press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1 now. Again, that is star 1 if you would like to ask a question. Thank you. Our first question comes from Zaid Benjamin from Radio Sawa. Zaid, your line is now open. Hello, do you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my question is about the uh, latest uh, 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 reconciliation between uh, Israel and uh, Turkey. What lessons uh, should we learn from that and how we can implement it on the peace process? Well, I don't, I don't think there's much to learn from that about the peace process. It only shows that at some point, interests of both Israel and Turkey trump issues of uh, national glory, prestige, and humiliation. And that uh, even for hardline ideological figure like Erdogan, uh, at the present, at the present uh, regional and international situation, it's better to work with Israel rather than against it. And I also believe that there is some kind of uh, farewell present by both leaders to President Obama, uh, because I believe there was much American involvement in putting this, uh, this uh, agreement together, and that might buy some points for some points for Netanyahu, as he wants a new uh, um, military support deal from Obama, and as he seeks to avoid any last-minute American move at the Security Council uh, regarding the two-state solution. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bill Weiss from Mondo Weiss. Uh, wondering how the experts respond to uh, the recent charges by uh, Yair Golan, uh, the uh, deputy chief of staff, and from uh, former defense minister uh, Moshe Yalom that Israel is developing fascistic tendencies, that uh, Israeli political culture is, and uh, reminiscent even of uh, the Nazi period. Uh, how important are these developments? Thank you. Well, these are not, this, this was not uh, former Defense Minister Yalon, but former Prime Defense Minister Ehud Barak, uh, who echoed the, the speech by Er Golan. Well, I see it as kind of a revolt of the military establishment against the, the Netanyahu revolution. And uh, they feel, by the way, Netanyahu throughout his career has always been at odds with the military and to some extent the intelligence leadership uh, working with him. And, uh, and, and they adopted, uh, they adopted uh, the line of the Israeli left wing and of many writers, for us at Aris, who warned against erosion of democracy as the price of more national, more national Israel, and as the price of, of preparing us to, towards permanent occupation. Uh, one more point is that in Israel, the education system teaches mostly two things: that are the Bible, the Old Testament, and and um, and the Holocaust. The so most analogies, 99% of OPEC uh, and politics teaches an argument in Israel. The quotes, the references, are either from the Bible or, or about the Nazis and the Holocaust, because people don't really have other frames of reference, and you have to take that into account as well. Martin, do you have anything to add, or Rob? I would just add, perhaps, in, um, um, 
in relation to Netanyahu and the officers. Um, Netanyahu has um, perhaps, perhaps learned from the experience of Menachem Begin to be a bit wary of, um, of uh, the high brass. Of course, the, the um, uh, Menachem Begin was the one who wound up in Lebanon in a disastrous war, which led him to uh, end his life in uh, self-seclusion. Um, and it's interesting that uh, subsequent Likud prime ministers have proven to be very risk-averse. They've been um, uh, very cautious and actually had a tendency to rein in at various times um, their, um, and their military, or at least not to see it as a tool which can be readily and easily used. And one of the points I made in my article was that the reason that the Israelis keep returning Netanyahu to office, <clears throat> aside from the economics, which I think is important and which was scanted in all of our pieces, is, um, is the fact that he has remained risk-averse when it comes to uh, military engagement. Um, he has um, been prime minister for longer than anyone except uh, David Ben-Gurion, and he's been involved in only one uh, hot conflict. Many Israelis are even reluctant to call it a war, the last conflict in Gaza, which had a very short round phase. Um, and I think that um, the departure of Yalon has an interesting um, a subtext, actually, when one thinks about it, uh, whatever it indicates about the state of relations between uh, Netanyahu and the military, it does very much suggest that the Netanyahu does not believe that in the, in the, in the course of the rest of his uh, term in office, he is going to need a defense minister who is um, uh, of the caliber of a, uh, of a Moshe Yalon. Um, a Lieberman will do. That's because there is no, uh, not on, 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 uh, in planning anything like an Iran operation. That's, of course, scuttered uh, for now, and, uh, or even something even more ambitious. Um, so Lieberman is good enough to deal with stabbings and the occasional, um, an occasional um, and, and trouble on the Palestinian front, uh, maybe even in the case of, um, of a flare-up with Hezbollah, although it seems very remote at, at this present time, given the way Hezbollah is immersed in Syria. So in, a, in, a, in an odd way, Yalon's departure is reassuring. It uh, certainly tells me that Netanyahu doesn't have a major military operation plan between now and the day in which he actually does surpass David Ben-Gurion as the longest-serving prime minister in Israel. Rob, if, if, if I could just have... Yeah, just one observation, I think, uh, and this may be overstated a bit, but it seems to me, uh, and I was actually in attendance with uh, when both uh, Boogie Alon and, and uh, Ehud Barak made their comments uh, uh, 10 days ago or so, you know, is that in, in a sense, and this may be overstated, I think while the one thing that's very significant is you may, the, that the nature of the opposition in Israel may be shifting. Uh, there's been a widespread disappointment uh, in Israel with the leader of the opposition, uh, Bougie Herzog, uh, which then culminated in his uh, failed flirtation, shall we say, uh, uh, in which he was negotiating with Prime Minister Netanyahu to enter the government. Uh, and he's been relatively um, reluctant to challenge uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu on, on security grounds. Uh, and he has represented himself as the leader of the opposition, and therefore try, trying to find a, a kind of a, a consensus view of the opposition, much to, the, I think, the dismay of many of the prime minister's critics. The fact now that you've had a former prime minister stand up, uh, as well as former defense minister, a former head of the, uh, both of them former chiefs of staff, and challenge the prime minister on security grounds, you know, accusing him of, in essence, taking Israel to the edge of the abyss, I think was the term used, uh, I think introduces a new element in the political dynamics of Israel today. It's premature to talk about the end of the Netanyahu era because there's no elections in the offing, there's no mechanism in the offing, but it may be a change in the nature of the opposition to Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, shifting away from the traditional sort of left labor liberal approach to a more centrist security uh, establishment uh, that is rising up. Uh, and, that, and that, to me, is something interesting and, and, and uh, something to watch. Thank you. Again, if anyone would like to ask a question, please press star 1 now. Again, that is star 1 if you would like to ask a question. <laughs> 
At this time, I'm showing no further questions. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there then. Thank you, Olive Martin and Rob, for joining us. Again, uh, they're all the authors of essays in the latest edition of Foreign Affairs, The Struggle for Israel. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for listening to this Council on Foreign Relations podcast. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online, cfr.org.